Good morning. Today's the big day. And the mic is working. Today's a big day. We've been planning this since September. And there are lots of conferences in New York already. Let me start with, why are we doing this? There are plenty of conferences. Columbia Business School puts on a lot of conferences. There are lots of tech events. But nobody talks about the hard stuff. Today is about the hard stuff. Today isn't about, I'm going to come on stage and give you lots of buzzwords and predict the future. Our speakers are here to talk about what stage they're in in building their life's dreams, how they decided to launch something, what are the struggles of scaling that. Our speakers are here to answer your questions about what does it take to get from an idea to an IPO and beyond. So we invite you not to just sit back and take it in, but to sit back and introspect and ask the questions that are about tactical techniques. Ask the questions about the decisions you're facing this morning. Today isn't about as much about the speakers here as it is about you. So we invite you to embrace it. So there'll be every speaker will have questions post um, for about eight minutes. And we'll run mics around to get you that opportunity. And most people will stick around through lunch and beyond for you to be able to engage with them. The story of Alicon is very simple. The students at Columbia Business School run many, many different tech clubs, from the entrepreneurship organization to something called the Technology Business Group, to the Venture Capital Club and the Data Analytics Club. All four of us got together to discuss an event that caters not just to a question about how to get a job in tech or how to start a company, but how do you actually grow this tech venture? So all four clubs came together, pooled our resources, built this beautiful, wonderful team that we couldn't do this without, raised some lovely sponsors who, who helped us out tremendously and who we couldn't do without, and made this day happen. So one, we'd love for you to start with a huge round of applause for our sponsors and our team. <laughs> and some quick logistical announcements. Questions are going to be run through via mics, and we'll have, the, uh, we'll have the person on stage come and orchestrate how the questions will be run. The interesting thing about this venue is that while it's really pretty, all the bathrooms are downstairs. <laughs> so the breaks are really long to accommodate that. Uh, there is also a startup lounge and a tech demonstration area when you go walk downstairs. So that area during lunch, you'll have lots of interesting things to mingle about, but also technology ideas to experience, and that's what we've crafted. We're also really excited about the food. We've ordered a lot of food, so don't let it go to waste. Um, our hashtag is at AliConNYC. We'd love for you to go join us on Instagram right now. We've got this little surprise for you. Instagram stories are a huge thing. If you're not doing it, I joined last week, I have to admit. Um, if you're not doing it, here's an opportunity to jump on the bandwagon. The person with the best Instagram stories coming up through the day wins an Xbox. Just as a little perk for engaging on our social media spectrum. Um, we have also a photo booth downstairs near the staircase. Go wild. Hashtag away. And we might have some people from the media approach you for questions uh, as part of an interview or for some videos. You're welcome to go wild and be honest. <laughs> Any questions that I can answer right now? No, we're good to go. Our speakers are going to be doing wildly different formats from how do you scale, how do you get your first thousand users, and he, the first speaker is going to demonstrate that, to how do you launch a blockchain company out of college, to how do you um, transition from corporate America to startup land while you're an MBA student, et cetera, et cetera. All of them will have different ways that they're going to ask you out for questions, so feel free to engage. And throughout the day, there's going to be snacks and coffee, et cetera, et cetera, available outside. And that's all my logistical announcements. Remember, this day is for you. Go ahead. Yes, the whole thing is live streamed and recorded, so you can be famous. 
That's it. I want to introduce our moderator for the first segment, the launch segment. He's the professor at Columbia Business School. He teaches the Launch Your Startup class, and he's a partner at Contour Ventures. He's a lovely guy. He has tremendous energy. Please put your hand together for Owen Davis. Hey. Thank you, Pratik. Thank you. <clears throat> so I guess the first real thing to say is this is an amazing uh, sort of get together because for years um, the conference, the venture sort of conference has always been embedded in something else. And this is a real demonstration of just how important the pressure of entrepreneurship um, has become in terms of sort of birthing, in essence, its own conference. And students took it upon themselves because they felt that pressure and they saw the importance as sort of a very separate discipline uh, to sort of bring it to the forefront and not have it be part of what has historically been sort of some other conferences. So I know that the students have worked enormously hard over the last probably nine months maybe uh, to sort of get this together and it's really amazing that it did come together. So, so the first part of the, 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 um, the day is about launch. Right? And so, so what do you do with an idea? And where do ideas come from? Uh, how do you sort of turn something that you may think is a good idea into something that people really want? A product that is great, that matches a market need, and what is the process that you go through and the trials and the tribulations to sort of get that done? So you'll find that many of the entrepreneurs that you'll see today have many similar traits, right? They're all different. There is no single definition of what an entrepreneur is. Um, but there are some commonalities, right? There's deep commitment to their idea. There's always energy. There's always sort of a focus. There's always sort of being, seeing something that seems very, very obvious and may not be apparent to anybody else. And so I think that you'll find through sort of everybody uh, a, sim a similar thread um, across everyone in terms of that respect. Um, I would, as you're listening to speakers, jot down questions because this really is for you, right? You're, you know, in, in my class I say you're the brain trust, right? So the brain trust needs to work. Um, sort of together and make sure that you're jotting down notes, you're asking great questions, and you're engaging and learning and sort of pulling out the insights from everybody sort of that's talking. So um, the first speaker, we can call him uh, the person formerly known as the founder of Venmo, but his real name is actually Ikram. And he's now working on his next startup called Ents. Um, and, and Ents really tries to reimagine communication um, and the challenges of gaining broad adoption to go from zero to 60, right, with a viral product is daunting. So Ikram is doing it twice. Why not? So Ikram. Check. Oh, good morning. How y'all doing? Good? It's been a while since I've been on stage like this. But um, so first things first, that's, this is the, uh, the new company that I'm working on. And it kind of fits into what we're about to do today because we can do an interactive demo in the, in the middle of the, the talk. So what I, while I'm kind of sharing my story, if you could get set up on Ents, um, this kind of ties into what it takes to actually build a startup from the beginning. Um, sometimes you have, the, you have to have the courage to come on, get on stage in front of a group of strangers and say, hey, pull your phones out, um, download this free app called Ents, and we're going to use it at the end of the talk um, in an interesting way. So, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a Q&A. Uh, hey, what's up? <laughs> that's an old friend of mine right there. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, uh, so we're going to do, do a Q&A. And how we prioritize the Q&A is by, uh, through Ents. And pe the people that have Ents get to ask their questions first. And what's cool about that is not only do we benefit from the question and answers, um, everyone in the world does. So, 
So if by, by using ENDS to ask your question, you're helping us contribute to the knowledge base of society. So, um, <clears throat> and since we are at a, at a as sort of a business uh, tech conference, I'd like to offer up some healthy competition. I know that uh, the best Instagram story is getting a, an Xbox. Well, the best ENTS is going to get a Google Daydream. So we're going to, uh, you know, at the, end of the, at, a, at the end of the conference, any, any ENTS that's hashtagged Ali Khan NYC, we'll listen to all of them, and we'll pick the best, and the best gets a, a Google Daydream. You know what, does, raise your hand if you know what that is. Oh, wow. Okay. So for those that didn't raise their hands, the Google Daydream is an, a VR system. So raise your, raise your hand if you know about virtual reality. Wow, there we go. So that's you know it's kind of like the future, um, so yeah we'll, we'll <clears throat> so get your daydream, get your daydream on. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I th first of all thank you for having me. I I, I was born and raised in uh, in Africa uh, and starting from Zimbabwe. So I was born in Zimbabwe, and I spent the first uh, seven years there, and then I moved to Zambia. Um, and after Zambia, I spent some time in Uganda. Um, and when I was 14, I immigrated with my mom to the United States, uh, and I went to a, I went to a school in Virginia. Um, so that's how I that's how I kind of got here. And then eventually, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, where I met my roommate Andrew Cortina, who is the co-founder of Venmo, and we got to know each other there. Coinc coincidentally, we met each other. We spent four years there, uh, and we'd worked on a ton of projects together. Uh, startups in school. We, we, we happened to be uh, seniors when Facebook launched. And I remember when that happened, as soon as Facebook launched, Cortina and I got together and said, because Facebook at the time was Harvard only, and we were at uh, UPenn, and we said, maybe we should do our own version of Facebook here. But we didn't. <laughs> so lesson, lesson there is, once you talk about it, you got to figure out how to get those first thousand users because a lot of ideas, and I've seen this over and over again. Um, and, you know, I'm see we were sitting on the next Facebook, but I've seen this over and over again. People, you know, out at bars or in class or whatever, they get together with their friends and they talk about an idea, but they never take the next step to actually go on and execute it. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, <clears throat> the lesson that I've learned over time is that it takes a lot of time and hard work to cross that kind of threshold of the first few users, because you need those users to give you feedback, feedback on what you're doing. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how we find, we kind of, you know, Cortina and I arrived at Venmo as something that we wanted to work on. So we left, we left uh, school with degrees. Um, I took an extra year because I, I was lagging, I was running behind, but um, eventually I graduated. But in that year, Cortina and I explored a ton, of, a ton of ideas. So the first thing that we did was we went around um, in Philadelphia and we knocked on every, every restaurant, rest, restaurant's door and we said, hey, we'll make you a website if you give us free food. And that's how we started our entrepreneurship career, I would say. And I, it was surprising, a lot many people did it. Like people were, <laughs> restaurants were very stingy with their food. So eventually we said, we, you know, we, <laughs> because all we wanted to do was eat. So we, knocked, we went around and we knocked on the same restaurants and we said, all right, we'll make you a website for $200. And all of a sudden, like, people were just going bam, 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 bam. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so that's how we got our start. I think, I think by the time we uh, finished doing that, we had about 100 restaurants on, we called it uh, the Kalan. And that's how we paid our rent, and that's how we kind of like learned how to build and sell and present our first few ideas to people. And you can imagine like interacting with different restaurant owners. Like, think about think about that. I like that. Someone's got ends on in the back. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how we got to know lots of different types of people. Like interacting with different restaurant owners, and everyone had a different working schedule. Like trying to set up a time to work with a restaurant owner is possibly the hardest thing in the world, because um, you're inevitably going to meet them after midnight. <laughs> and so you you know. But what I learned there is you just have to be there when they're ready to listen. So um, after the restaurants, Cortina and I decided you know this this is probably not going to scale into something that can fund all the life that we imagine. So let's join a startup or let's try and do something different that can help us grow 
into what we want to do eventually, which was we've, we always talked about running our own company or working for ourselves or doing things that we could, uh, we could control. So Cortina and I ended up joining a company in New York uh, called I'm In Like With You. Um, and then I'm In Like With You eventually became the company that made the game Draw Something. Have, have, any, have you played that? The fun, you know, Pictionary type game. Uh, so <clears throat> one of the attributes that we looked for when we joined I'm In Like With You were a company that was very early, that hadn't raised any money, but had, uh, sorry, hadn't raised a Series A round of funding, which is uh, an equity round, but had, had enough to pay us 60K a year. So, that was, so we weren't making any money until we joined I'm In Like With You. Everything else was restaurants and part-time jobs. So the other requirement was enough to pay us 60K a year each, um, was a place that had less than six people. So we would essentially be on the founding team or whatever you want to call it. When you're that early, everyone's sort of building the company together. Um, and people that seemed you know, very interesting and had good chops, so we call it chops. So chops means like people that were very good engineers, very good designers, so we could learn from them. So uh, eventually we joined, so how we found uh, I'm In Like With You was, there was this, there's this thing, now it's very popular, it's called Y Combinator, which is a pretty large incubator. But <clears throat> we scoured Y Combinator, uh, Y Combinator's first class of companies for potential fits for us. And um, the company we found there, this was the first class that was sort of graduating from Y Combinator. And the, 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 uh, the, the company that we ended up working for was I'm In Like With You. We came up to New York City. It was two guys. They were like, yo, we just finished Y Combinator. We didn't really know much about it, but we kind of did, so, you know, did some Googling. Oh, wow, Y Combinator started by the guy that did Google. Oh, sorry, Gmail. And then you started, you know, Paul Graham. This guy's known for this, 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 this. And we're like, okay. Maybe we'll get to meet those people someday or learn through osmosis that way. Um, and then Cortina and I ended up spending about eight months there. It was very, very rigorous. We worked pretty much 24 seven. I was coding pretty much from the minute I got to the office to 4 a.m. and then rinse and repeat every day. Um, but there I learned how to really build something uh, that could scale. Because when you, when you talk about something like draw something, you're talking about millions of people hitting a product all at once, simultaneously, bam, 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 bam. So you, you, know, you hear a lot about Friendster, for example, how they've failed to scale as they grew. But from I, I'm In Like With You, I learned like, how to really architect a system that could scale and then execute it. Um, so if I had any advice for people in the room that are thinking of starting a company but don't necessarily know what it's going to be or uh, want, to take, want to take a little time to get there, Try and find a company that is up and coming, that has, you know, that you feel like there's a cultural fit because while they're going through the process of learning how they're gonna raise their first round of funding to, to building uh, you know, that first team, to putting out the first fire, you'll be able to help them. And then when it's time for you to start your company, you'll be, very, you'll be a seasoned veteran. So a lot of the things that I learned at I'm In Like With You, we applied at Venmo. And I guess the moral of the story is, uh, Every, everything that Venmo became was a result of everything we'd worked on in the past, just the experiences that we had. So it's important to put yourself in experiences that can really help craft your future. Um, and so I, well, I'm, I'm very grateful for the time I spent knocking on restaurants do restaurant doors and uh, working at I'm In Like With You. Um, after that, we kind of, Cortina and I separated. We, did, we were doing our own thing. I was working at a company called Ticket Leap in Philadelphia. He worked inside this incubator called Betaworks uh, on Bitly. And then we started to, to get that itch again because we were working at other companies. Um, and I think it was in 2009, Cortina and I start, you know, we're messaging each other on IM, Instant Messenger, WhatsApp now, I guess. And uh, we're talking about, Yo, let's get back in the game. I feel like we're itching to kind of like get together and like make something. And we set three kind of goals to our brainstorming sessions. Now, I say bra brainstorming is a very formal term. I mean, our bra brainstorming sessions took place on the couch, bars and restaurants and all that sort of thing. But we did have criteria. And the criteria was, one, we wanted to be, we wanted to do something in a space that was kind of, uh, um, that was, uh, trendy. Um, so if I had to apply that to Ents, 
the trend that we're trying to follow with ENTS is voice. Voice right now, I mean, have you hear how everyone's talking about voice is the future, voice is the future, voice is the future, so we're right in it. Um, at the time, at, with Venmo, it was mobile, mobile. Everyone's talking about how everyone's getting an iPhone and mobile, mobile. Everyone's going to switch from their computers and these Blackberries to this smart device that you can tap and da 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 da. So we're like, okay, we have to do that. We have to be there no matter what it is. The other thing we, we wanted to do uh, was uh, something that we could use with each other. So if I compare that to ENTS, I use ENTS probably about six, six to seven times a day. And and I use it with my friends, I use it with other people. And with Venmo, we said the same thing. We want to be able to do something where we're using it with each other because that's one interesting way of inventing something or causing an impact because if you make something that you use, that other people use, that other, other people use, then uh, you have something kind of interesting. Um, and when you're, going back through, when you're going back to the drawing board, uh, you, uh, you, you get instant feedback. And the final thing was, uh, we wanted a remote schedule. We wanted to be able to work whenever we wanted. And that was it. So how Venmo started was we're at a, we're at a, at a uh, concert and we see a band and they're passing the tip jar around. And they go, if you like the band, tip us. And uh, uh, Cortina and I are up there with Blackberries and we're saying, we're not going to do that because <laughs> that's kind of annoying. We don't have cash. We're not going to run to an ATM. So what if we could just use our Blackberry to send money to the band? And that was sort of the first time the idea of Venmo popped into our heads. And the next day, we made this slide, which is Venmo enables, uh, we started with musicians, um, but really anyone to accept payments for anything. But at the time, we were thinking songs, merchandise, and subscriptions anytime. And uh, we replaced SMS with that. So that was the first sort of slide because Cortina and I, you know, we, we like to think big <laughs> or we like to think we think big. And the idea was we don't want to just make it for musicians. We want to make it for everybody. But we, the niche that we carved out early on was musicians. And to further elaborate on that, this was kind of the first drawing of Venmo ever. And that was actually the first logo. Um, so now this is all great. <clears throat> so what you see here is, you know, Corti um, that's probably me. Cortina drew this. <laughs> I'm right there. Uh, I'm sending a text message into Venmo. Venmo is taking that, da -da -da -da, all that information. So in, in, in essence, this is our business plan. Just a picture. We did this at Cozy, you know, at, a, at a coffee shop. Now that's great, right? That's all it takes. I mean, that, normally, you know, I will say this, most people leave off at this point. They're like, great idea. <laughs> Let's move on to the next one. And in, in some ways, Cortina and I would do the same thing. But something kept drawing us back to wanting to work on this. And what it was, was one weekend, I was in Philadelphia. I left, off, I left my house without a wallet, and I was you know, running to catch a bus. I had my Blackberry, and uh, I was coming to meet Cortina because we were going to hang out and talk more about what we wanted to work on. This is after we drew this. And at the dinner table, and so I, so I didn't have my wallet. I had a Blackberry. And at the, at the, and at the dinner table, um, Cortina and I look at each other on Sunday as I'm coming back home, and, they say, and we say, hey, uh, what if we could just, as soon as the bill comes, what if we could just send, what if I could send you the money for this meal uh, with our Blackberries? And that was it. That was the Eureka moment for us. It was like, ah, now we've arrived at something that we could use it with each other. Because this, you know, the first version was musicians. And this version is still musicians. But as soon as we had that aha moment of, oh, this is how we can use it with each other. It sounds very simple. That's when we were like, okay, let's build it. And then from that day forward, Cortina basically spread, spent every waking moment working on Venmo and refining the product and using it with each other, telling our friends about it. So I have a minute left, and I'm going to tell, I guess, the one story that stands out the most that I don't share. Uh, I haven't shared anyway, really. I mean, it's not, it's not a big deal, but it's, it, it kind of represents what it takes to get people on Venmo. Now, you can imagine me and Cortina running around. Like imagine, if, imagine if I came in this room and I said, all right, everybody, pull out your phones. Uh, put your credit card number in or your bank account and you're going to send me five bucks for this meal or pull out your phones. I'm doing a fundraiser. You're all going to send money through this service that you've never heard before. That was the main challenge that we faced and we still in some ways today face, uh, but not, not as much, of course, but back then, the challenge that we faced once we had the prototype of, Ven of Venmo was how are we going to get every single person in this room that 
has to what, immediately trust us uh, with their financial information to, to use Venmo. Um, and the answer is I would guilt people into it. <laughs> and here's how I did it. I would go the first, so I would say the first 500 people that, uh, that joined Venmo came from me and Cortina and some other people going to restaurants. And imagine this, so the waiter would bring the, the check uh, to the table and the waiter would say, hey, this meal was on that guy. <laughs> and they were like, that guy? <laughs> me? And they're pointing at me, or they're pointing at Cortina. And then I would go over to the table and I would say, hey, yeah, you know, uh, I'm working on this new thing. And it's a way for us to pay each other if we're at the restaurant. And if you know, let, look, you know what the worst feeling in the world for, the, for a restaurant owner is? When six people put a credit card down and say, can you split it? <laughs> so here's why that's a pain point for restaurants. It's because every time the, guy, the restaurant owner swipes the credit card, um, they're charged a little transaction fee. So when you split the, the credit card six, when you split a bill six ways like that, you're causing, one, it's, it's, it's really annoying. Uh, we have this thing on ends called chefs talking shit. And it's all about like some of the encounters uh, restaurant owners and waiters face when customers come in. That's definitely one of them. It's like you're at a table with 16 people and it's like, uh, would, you mind, uh, would you mind splitting this 16 ways? <laughs> And the guy and the, the waiter is like, dang, bam, bam, bam. Now, this sounds like an insane, simple, or whatever. It sounds like that's what it took to, to get the first 500 users on Venmo. And the answer is yes. We literally went to restaurants. and I would put my credit card down, rack up, thanks to Visa. Thank you, Visa. Visa was very helpful. Um, and look, a lot of the time, because the, the thing is, we, I didn't force people to pay me back. I just said, hey, this one's on me. I just, I just want five minutes of your time to talk about this new thing I'm working on. It's called Venmo. Here's how it works. If you're ever in this situation, you can use it with each other. And, uh, um, you know, I would say two out of the ten, two out of every five times after I would do that, people would actually get their phones. I mean, you know, that's kind of cool. Whoa. And you wait. And then, you know, they'd boom and they'd pay me. And then, you know, I'd, we'd send a little marketing email. It was like, hey, oh, that's great. Next time you're out, please use Venmo again. And, Slowly but surely, um, we started to see, so the, sh the, the most shocking thing to me was when I would do that to a group of strangers at a restaurant in Philadelphia. I had two places, this, this Chinese restaurant that I loved and uh, a Thai place. <laughs> Diver di diverse cuisine choices. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would do that. Uh, and I would, the, the thing that, and then I'd, I'd literally come home and I'd be like, watching the logs, and I'd see Cortina paid this, Ikram paid this, Cortina paid this, Ikram paid this, Cortina, 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 Cortina Ikram, 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 I'm like, okay. And then every now and then, I'd see one of these people from the restaurant like send money to someone that they didn't know, and I was like, oh, we've got something. Because if someone that you don't know downloads your product, uses it with somebody else, you have something that's compelling enough to bring to the rest of the world. And once we, and once we were there, we realized that all Venmo needed was a good marketing team. And then we built the rest from there. So that's kind of how we got it off the ground. All right. Uh, let's open it up to questions. So uh, raise your hand if you have ENTS and you want to answer, ask a question. OK. You're, you're, you're going to be the first. You're gonna, so do you have ENTS on you? I do not have ENTS. Oh, you have, so does anyone here have ENTS that wants to ask a question? There we go. Wait, no, but wait, you have to, so you have to participate in the demo. Mike is coming, so here's how it works. While you ask your question, make an ENTS and make it public so everyone can hear it. And then I'm, as I answer the question, I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. I got it. Now, did you did you, you you put that out there? I did. Okay, let me just hear it again because I was too focused on seeing you and I was like, wow, you know, that's a shocking moment. But the good thing is we got it. No, we got I got it. Okay. Uh, let me just see. Your question was. Let's see if I can use this mic here. Are you Jaisa Minor? Jaisa. Jaisa. Okay, nice to meet you. Here's a. Okay, so I just talk into it? Yeah. Okay, so my question is, what role did trust play when you were starting your company um, as far as getting consumers to adopt the app, and how did you go about gaining that trust? 
you asked quite possibly the question that everyone asked us, which was the hardest thing to overcome. Um, and early on, it was, so what we did, so early on, it was a lot of brute force, like convincing people, like, hey, look, trust me, you know me. <laughs> We're backing up everything securely. All of these transactions are taken care of uh, securely. And then eventually, uh, what we did was we established a banking partnership with this, with, you know, uh, Wells Fargo, who Venmo is forever grateful for. They were the only bank in, of everybody to say, hey, we're going to bring on two 27-year-olds that have no experience in financial tech and let them partner with us. So John Huber and Tina Sadegi, Patrice, uh, Patrice uh, and all of Wells Fargo, thank you so much for, for bringing us on. Uh, and yeah, they, so they partnered with us. And as soon as we got that relationship, so up until then it was like, no, no trust me, this is all good. As soon as we got the banking relationship, then we had to put our compliance things in order. And someone would say, so how do we trust you? I'd say, well, if you trust Wells Fargo, you trust us. Everything that, everything that uh, Venmo does is built on top of Wells Fargo. We spent three months establishing all the compliance requirements needed for that. And then people would be like, dope. <laughs> so that's, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right, who's the next answer? And the mic's coming there. Hold it down and yeah. Okay, so once you reach your initial user base, how did you scale? Let me just wait for that to come in. Because what I'm doing is I'm replying to each and end so that we have a conversation and then anyone can kind of listen to the Q&A. But make sure, oh, I tried again, yeah. Your initial user base, how did you scale? Did you post it? Are you, uh, are you Fitz? Yeah. Oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> See, I'm getting to know people too. I got the names, the faces. Okay, so once we, the, if I had to isolate one of the things that really helped us get to the first 100,000 users or to get that kind of momentum going, we added a referral program to Venmo. And how it worked was this. You, you, as soon as, now we don't do that anymore. Uh, we were giving five, at one point we were giving everybody $5 for every person that they brought on to Venmo that made a transaction. So we used to have this flow. Now this is some secret sauce right here. You'd open up, you'd open up Venmo, you'd sign up, uh, and then the first thing you would see is like fill out your profile. Second thing you'd see is these are everybody in your contacts. For every single person here that joins Venmo and makes a transaction, we'll, and we were, we were toggling between $1 and $5. We're gonna give you $1. But what that looked like to a user was, if you had 2,000 contacts, invite all your friends to Venmo, and you, 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 you can make $2,000 if they all make a transaction and sign up from your invite. Or you, you make that five, you know, now we're talking five times 2,000, which I can't do in my head anymore. But, <laughs> but yeah, so. Uh, so that's, that's what really, I would, if I had to isolate one thing, aside from the product being great and viral, like that really got an, so people would come through the sign up flow and be like, bam, invite all. We're, we're sending, we got to the point where we were sending hundreds of thousands of invites a day just because we had that referral program. And what was cool about it was we, we tied it to, a, to, a, to an outcome that we wanted, which was the people that sign up have to make a transaction. So that's how we did it. Okay, one more. Who's the last answer? She's saying one more, he's saying no more. <laughs> you got ants? Okay, let's go. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, yeah, I would love to answer that. That's a great, I mean. So did, did everyone hear the question? No. Let me. I'll ask. I'll, uh, let me. Let me play it for you. Who's next? Who, uh, so not next. I mean, I don't want to take too much time here, but we'll. Did you post that? Yeah. Are you Laurent? Yes. Did I pronounce that correctly? Laurent. Laurent. Okay. So here's the question. So you talk about uh, different trends uh, back in mobile and now it's voice. So how do you determine? The, uh, can you suggest other trends that you see? Uh, other than voice, and how do you kind of make your criteria to find out what is the next big? Oh shit! What so is so what? What is the next big thing? So let's let's uh, so you talk let's start with the elephant in the room. 
Blockchain, blockchain anybody? <laughs> yeah, crypto, Bitcoin, all of those things. So I think, I think over time, people that utilize the, and the next speaker from Carbon is gonna talk about that, which I'm very excited about. So uh, blockchain for one. Number two, immigration policies, like finding a way to make it so that we can all fit into the world that we you know, are all part of. Uh, number three, uh, VR and virtual reality and kind of like all these sort of places to escape in, in a fantasy world that are very immersive. So like, and for, and for learning purposes, like you could go into, you can go into uh, a room and like, you can all, it, like imagine how history could be taught through virtual reality. You could sort of witness and experience everything that's taking place. So those are, those are the three that I'd outline. I mean, I have, anything else ends me and I'll, I'll see if I can come up with more, but thank you. So thanks for your time, everybody. Um, so you get a flavor of sort of, we're beginning to sort of see at least a little bit about what goes into like getting an idea off the ground. Um, all of you know that cryptocurrencies are exploding, right? Tokens, the actual currencies themselves, the underlying infrastructure to handle what is gonna be sort of a universal database that has encryption and security and sort of a, a bunch of other sort of auditable functions around it, which will be very important for all sorts of industries. Um, yet, that infrastructure is really not built yet. Most of the things that uh, are dependent on making it reliable and stable and usable and scalable are really not in place. So Connor Lynn at Carbon is actually working on one aspect uh, of the infrastructure to make it usable and to make it sort of reliable uh, so that it can be utilized in a, in a regular and sort of ongoing way. Um, and with those pieces in place, the systems will start scaling and the infrastructures will be stable. So Connor? Thank you. Thanks. So thanks to Owen for that very informative uh, introduction. Um, as, he, as he mentioned, I'm uh, working on carbon and we're building a price-stable cryptocurrency. Uh, so I wanted to start this out with a little bit of, of a story on uh, how me and my co-founders got to know each other, um, because I think we have a pretty unique mix of people. Um, all four of us are college dropouts. We live in an apartment together in Hudson Yards. Uh, we rarely leave, almost never. <laughs> um, Uber eats everything. There's a gym in the building. It's great. Um, but so before, before Carbon, um, I worked at a number of startup companies in New York City and San Francisco. Um, was a student at Columbia, dropped out last semester. I was studying humanities and psychology. Um, and you know, I was sitting in my, my new apartment in Midtown and uh, was on Twitter, uh, connected with a friend through a mutual friend who I worked on an app with together. And uh, you know, he introduced me to a guy at USC who has been studying cryptocurrencies for like two years now. So we started Skyping a lot and uh, you know, talking about different ICOs. We did some investing together, which was pretty fun. Um, so you know, we kind of kept that conversation going. And then you know, one day, someone who he worked on a, a virtual Ethereum hackathon with, I didn't even know like, they worked together, but he just randomly followed me on Twitter. So I was like, OK, cool, right? Like this guy goes to Stanford. Like he's into cryptocurrencies. So I, I direct message him. I'm like, yo, like, I'm into crypto too. <laughs> and then um, you know, he's like, dude, I'm like, really into this like, stable coin um, concept. So you know, we, should, we should talk about it. So um, at the time, I was actually working at Consensus, which is uh, an Ethereum uh, studio building a lot of different decentralized applications. Um, so we FaceTime. And then uh, I'm like, yo, like, this guy's a chiller, right? So, um, he told me that he was going to Mexico like three days after our call to uh, go to DevCon. So DevCon is like um, the largest Ethereum hackathon. Highly recommend it. Like it's, everyone's there, like Vitalik speaks, um, all the guys working on like Casper speak. Um, so 
right after the call, or at the end of the call, I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna buy a plane ticket to Cancun, and we're gonna like share an Airbnb on like Monday. So, so I buy an air, airplane ticket, and then fly to Mexico, um, and then we meet up, and then Miles is in California, so Miles is the guy that I got introduced to. And then I called up Miles, who was literally in class. So he was like, he's a student at USC, he goes to the business school there, um, undergrad business school, and um, you know, he picks up, and he straight up takes the next ticket to Mexico. So all of a sudden, the three of us are in Mexico. Um, you know, we're all interested in stable coins, and we start kind of pretending that we're like a team. Like, we weren't actually a team, but we were like, yo, like, we have a company. <laughs> so, so we're like telling like all of these invest, I mean, there's so many, like, we call them Bitcoin lottery winners. Kind of like, you know, the, the guy, your, na your neighbor who like, bought Bitcoin at like $10, who's like rich now. Um, we told like all of these Bitcoin lottery winners like, all right, we're building the stable coin, like we're trying to um, you know, make like a, like a new world currency. And like people were like, yo, like when can we write you a check? Like they literally took out their checkbook. And you know, we haven't incorporated or anything. Um, so we were like, shit, like this could be like a real thing. I probably shouldn't have sweared. Um, but we were like, damn, like this could be a, a real. <laughs> Like, this could be a real, real company. So um, we, we started like brainstorming ideas, started brainstorming the concept more. Um, you know, we were actually zip lining when we thought of carbon in Mexico. <laughs> uh, so we started working on this company. Everyone comes back. And I'm immediately trying to get everyone to drop out. So like, there's three people, <laughs> two at Stanford, one at USC. Um, Gavin and Sam, they, they met like freshman year, and they, they were seniors. So, Within like three hours, I got everyone to drop out. They all told their parents. <laughs> their parents were like, they were like, what the, like what is going on? <laughs> right, like one trip to Mexico. Um, so everyone drops out. Um, you know, we're working on this full time. We're Skyping every single day, working on the white paper, working on the deck, talking to investors. Um, I, I quit my job, so I was working on this full time with no salary for a while. Um, and everyone flies to New York. We get this apartment together, um, and you know that that kind of brings me here. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know what we're building at Carbon, uh, why we think it matters, and uh, you know what the future looks like. So I think how many people here own any sort of cryptocurrencies? Okay, cool. So you know I think it's no surprise to a lot of us here that you know crypto has done extremely extremely well in uh, in price. You know some of the the highest returning ICOs actually have well over 100,000% plus returns, um, which is just absurd. Um, but you know, with all of this hype, all of this new investment in the space, um, you know, what's holding us back from really taking crypto to the next level? And fundamentally, we think the two things are throughput and volatility. The volatility um, issue mainly stems from the fact that most cryptocurrencies are fixed supply. right? So um, taking Bitcoin as an example, there's only 21 million that are ever going to be in existence. And uh, because of that, it can't react in fluctuating demand. So when demand fluctuates, the underlying per unit cost fluctuates as well. So how are we going to solve these two things that are really going to bring um, you know, distributed ledgers and cryptocurrency to the rest of the world? Well, with throughput, we have a lot of really, really promising solutions by people much older and much smarter than us. Um, Hashgraph, for example is a project that we really like that uses a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Um, Ethereum has its own scaling that's probably gonna take it to, to thousands of transactions per second. Um, we have EOS, which uses a new sort of consensus algorithm, um, as well as Lightning Labs, Blockstart Labs, which is doing on-chain scaling. And then for volatility, of course, we have stable coins, which is us. Um, fundamentally, there have been three approaches um, to trying to build a stable coin. Um, the first is fiat backed. Um, so everyone that owns cryptocurrency is probably aware of um, Tether. Um, so Tether you know, backs each coin with one US dollar in a bank in an unknown country. Um, and then you have MakerDAO, um, which do, has an over collateralization model using Ether as the underlying collateral. Um, so you can think of Tether as being uh, centralized and collateralized. MakerDAO is decentralized and collateralized. Um, and then the last bucket, which is the one that we fall into as well, um, is decentralized and uncollateralized. So there's no 
underlying asset that backs the value of the coin. Um, <clears throat> one of the biggest players in this space um, is Basecoin, and the way they achieve price stability is uh, they, they use a, a bond market, basically. So how do we achieve you know, stability? Uh, we uh, have an elastic supply policy where we can basically expand and contract the supply um, based on the demand. So there's, there's a two-token model. Um, token A is the stable coin. Um, token B is a free-floating currency that can be worth $1,000, $10,000, whatever it may be. Um, if we need to you know, contract the supply, we basically auction off token B, the non-stable coin. And if we need to expand the supply, the protocol mints new coins and uh, distributes them to the, uh, the free-floating currency. So on a high level, how this works is uh, in a contractionary phase, <coughs> we have a decentralized oracle that uploads the exchange rate, um, basically whatever carbon is trading at, to, to our protocol. So let's say that this is, um, in a contraction, it would be under a dollar, meaning that demand is uh, lower than the, the circulating supply. Um, the protocol has to contract, so um, carbon credits are minted and then auction off via uh, our, our web interface and smart contract, which uh, brings the price back to $1. And then when we expand, that's super easy because we're basically just printing money. Um, so with the protocol prints new, uh, mints new um, stable coin, and then distributes them pro rata to holders of the carbon credit token. So <clears throat> you know, what, can we, what can we use something like carbon for? Um, I mean, really, whatever you can use money for, right? So like general value transfer, that would be like Swift, PayPal, um, you know, any sort of credit card company, MasterCard, Visa, um, cross-border remittances, right? Like if, if you're in the US and you wanna send money back to your family in the Philippines, um, you know, you have to go through something like Western Union, which incurs very, very high fees and is extremely slow. Um, cryptocurrency trading pair, Tether has about $3 billion in um, daily transactional volume. Um, and then I think the most interesting thing for us, and just like cryptocurrency in general, is uh, this, this, this ability to create programmable money, right? So like with smart contracts, um, you can do anything that, I mean, with a, you know, with a Turing complete coding language, you can basically have arbitrarily complex language. Um, so you know, some use cases of this would be time-released funds, event-triggered payments. Um, we're actually going to be partnering with some pretty prominent ad tech companies where every time a user, um, you know, like clicks or like, um, you know, like finishes, like buys something, it releases like a little bit of funds to the marketer or something. So, you know, as I said, value transfer as we know it is, has really high fees, low customizability, and uh, is ex expensive for resolution as well. Um, here we can see <coughs> an example of how, what happens every time you swipe your credit card. Um, it goes through a lot of different centralized parties. Um, Visa, for example, one of the reasons why they've been able to um, have such dominant market share is they have a thousand page rule book, which basically um, you know, outlines all of these different hypothetical situations like merchant fees, um, different chargeback fees, resolution costs. And this is sort of the, the industry standard for what happens when something unexpected happens in the value transfer. But um, you know, with smart contracts, we can basically take this rule book and then we can crowdsource it. Right? So we can encode this entire thing into the value transfer itself um, so there doesn't have to be centralized third parties that step in and have to you know, like, um, handle those situations. And you know, getting rid of these centralized parties gets rid of costs tremendously. Um, so you know, using Swift for wire transfers, um, you know, cost $15 to $50. Credit card, you have um, you know, percentages based on the purchase amount. Um, PayPal, same thing. And with Carbon, within any two nodes in the Carbon network, we can get, uh, it costs less than a penny, and we can probably, get, we can probably do better than that as well. That, that's estimated right now. So with this programmable value transfer, um, we can you know, encode very high, we can have high contextualization in, in value transfer. Um, and you know, like I said, with, uh, with a Turing complete language, infinite complexity, and low resolution costs. 
Um, so I think the two, two common questions that we get from like investors and like people in our, in our community are, uh, you know, number one, you're pegged to the US dollar, right? Like what happens if the US dollar crashes, which is, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a while out, but it might, we'll see. <laughs> but, you know, you're pegged to the US dollar, so like what, what's up with that? And uh, secondly, um, you know, what are you gonna move it to? Oh, also, the second question was actually different. It was, what is it backed by? Like, what is the intrinsic value? Um, and I think a lot of times we kind of forget what fiat um, actually means. And it's, uh, you know, the formal definition is a currency that a government has declared to be legal tender, but is not backed by a physical commodity. So really, I mean, the line between cryptocurrencies and real currencies is, is very, very thin. Right? Like we have, with the US dollars specifically, I mean, we have this interest rate mechanism by the central bank and uh, also you know, an obligation to pay your taxes in US dollars, which sort of gives it value. But I, I don't think that um, you know, cryptocurrency is not being backed by anything is really uh, a, a good reason for us not to try to move towards cryptocurrencies as our main medium of exchange. And uh, you know, we can see <coughs> when we have uncontrolled um, central parties with, with all of this power, um, you know, sometimes it turns out pretty, pretty poorly. You can actually buy a $100 trillion note um, of Zimbabwean currency on eBay, which has a face value of about 40, 40 cents. So having said all that, uh, we do want to move away from the USD peg one day. Um, we can imagine ourselves moving to some sort of basket of goods. Um, CPIs are a possibility, so that's consumer price index. There's purchasing power indexes. Um, and then also, as the world gets more and more tokenized, um, baskets of tokens are, are also a potential very stable peg that doesn't rely on any um, governments. So in summary, carbon is a stable, programmable, lightning fast, and trustless money. If you'd like to learn more, our website is carbon.money, and uh, we're also hiring a lot of people, so uh, you can email me at connor at carbon.money. Thank you. So we have a couple minutes for questions, but before we open it up to the audience, and uh, I'd like to ask you a question that maybe the audience can talk about carbon and a company, but I want to ask you a personal question Definitely. around dropping out of school. Yeah. So what up, dude? Yeah. How'd that happen? What, was, so, what went into that? So I mean, I, I was always, uh, I, I felt um, like I missed out on like the, the internet boom, because like, I mean, I was like way too young to experience that. So uh, when I sort of started reading about blockchain, I started to realize like, this is, this is like the next one, you know? Um, and I was actually, I was sitting in my dorm room, and this was like mid, so this was sophomore year, like mid semester. And um, I was thinking like, okay, like I'm in New York, there's a lot of crypto companies here. I'm just kind of cold email like a bunch of people like I've always done, um, and then just try to get a job. And then, you know, when I go back home for winter break, when I come back, um, you know, maybe I can take a leave of absence or something. It ended up being like way more spontaneous than that. I was actually, sitting in my dorm room, and I think China just announced that um, they were like banning ICOs, and I held like a, a substantial amount of cryptocurrency, so like my, like everything was going crazy, like Twitter was like, there's blood in the streets, like the charts were like going crazy, um, and like I felt such a rush of like adrenaline, I was like damn, like I live for this. Um, so, so the next, basically the next day, like within, within two or three days, um, I ended up kind of submitting my forms. I decided in that moment, like, I'm not going to wait until the end of the semester. Like, I don't have a job, but, like, I'm just going to do it. Um, and, and that's kind of how it, how it turned out. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So what, what, let's, let's open it up to some questions. Um, and uh, anybody to get going? Oh, over there. Hi. Uh, my question is, what's your strategy to find the first 100 user? 100 users? Yeah, like yeah. the first users. Yeah, sure. So um, we definitely um, we don't want to go for a consumer at first. I think the only 
consumer um, use case that will get us a lot of users in the beginning is the cryptocurrency trading pair um, because, I mean, there's a clear market need for that. And, uh, you know, Tether, it, it's, it's unclear whether Tether will be able to scale to the size it needs to be. But um, for us, going back to the angle we're taking of, um, you know, going after the traditional value transfer space and, like, B2B value transfer, um, we're particularly interested in um, ad tech and gaming and anything with really digital assets, also online gambling. We're, we're um, partnered with a, an online gambling company um, as well as some ad tech companies in the pipeline. Um, and for them, it's really, they get, um, because they deal with digital assets, the stakes are kind of lower if um, it doesn't work as well as like whatever the incumbent solution is. Um, and then their risk tolerance is extremely high. Um, and they also get huge benefits from um, decreased cost. So, I mean, um, you know, any, any two nodes within the network um, are very, very cheap. So um, they would be using us in a lot of their sort of like internal value transfer. Could you explain the uh, values, the st uh, stability mechanism again and how that relates to like the value it holds? Because if you're trying to keep a, a stable token A and fluctuating token B, like what's the kind of expected future price of each? And I, don't under I didn't understand the first time around. Okay, sure. Yeah, so imagine you have like the, the stable coin. So as of now, that's pegged to the US dollar, or closely correlated with the US dollar. And then you have something called carbon credits. Um, let's say that's like $1,000, right? So let's say the stable coin is trading at 98 cents. Um, so we need to burn tokens, get rid of them from the supply in order to bring it back to a dollar. Uh, we basically mint new carbon credits, which um, I forgot what I said, like worth a thousand or $10,000. And then we auction those off. Um, so, I mean, we're looking at a d couple of different auction mechanisms, um, but it, it would be through like our own web interface. And then people basically bid to burn their stable coin to get this, this carbon credit. Um, and then if it's trading over a dollar and we need to expand the supply to bring it back down to a dollar, um, then we just mint new coins, and then we distribute them to the carbon credit holders. So they're, they're basically, I mean, it's really how any market works. They're taking risk, um, and then they're the ones getting the reward. So you're, you're letting basically punt on token B to stabilize token A. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yep. So the cryptocurrencies are, are super exciting, of course, especially like price-stable ones. Um, and I completely agree with what you said about the fact that it makes complete sense to have a fiat currency. I mean, after all, the U.S. dollar is such a currency, um, but in crypto. The one concern, though, that people have mentioned is that in the case of the U.S. dollar, the, the government regulates it. There is a sure. Fed. There is Absolutely. oversight. There is a, There are elections for it, right? Um, and therefore, there's public accountability. As this scales, or as the industry as a whole scales, how do you see that becoming an issue? Because, I mean, you trust you, I may trust you, but once the entire economy is operating on it and you control the price of it, where do you see the opportunity for public accountability and how can you uh, assuage those concerns? Yeah, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> getting to the size of um, the US dollar is not just like we're gonna, re whenever we release, like we're gonna go after that use case, because obviously, um, you know, not everyone's gonna trust us. So, um, and this also goes with a lot of ventures, but it's kind of like, how do you sequence markets and like slowly build up stability, liquidity, and trust? Because that's another aspect of it. It's like there's a very heavy psychological aspect in this, where like if people trust it, if people think it's worth a, worth a dollar, then it's far less likely that it'll be not worth a dollar, right? Um, so going back to, that, that sort of ties into our go-to-market strategy, which is not something like the, the nuances of that aren't something that we really say publicly. But um, I would say that we would slowly build up liquidity in a controlled environment um, and then basically get lots of um, sort of like corporate partners that add a lot of legitimacy to us. Um, you know, we're also looking to partner with uh, financial companies in the future as well as banks. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely have to control kind of like how we get to that point. Um, but I think. Um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Like that's that's certainly one of the one of the biggest challenges here. One more question. This is a tricky oh. one. Okay, I'm going to pass you the mic.
Thank you. Hi, um, my question is, you mentioned you have a few uh, tech companies down the pipeline to uh, partnership with. I'm just curious, like what kind of uh, applications you guys have been talking about? Because in an ad tech industry, actually we're talking for a long time last year and this year we do foresee an, a big adoption in the market, but we've actually looked at blockchain as a foundational technology to clean up the supply chain for us to um, expose the margin for the clients. But I'm very curious on like when it comes to cryptocurrencies, what are the applications you guys perhaps talk about um, you know, in upcoming um, partnerships? Thank sure. You. So um, specifically in ad tech, um, one use case that uh, we're really building towards is solving the prepayments problem. Um, so let's imagine that you have this marketing company and they're tasked with acquiring users, right? So there's, um, there's, there's a lot of different types of companies in this ecosystem, but typically they would pay this company upfront like $500,000 or like a million dollars, usually sometimes far more than that as well. And then they would be like, okay, now you go acquire the users, right? That's when you do the Facebook ads, you do the Google, Google ads and whatnot. Um, we actually have sort of like an informal advisor who, who knows a lot about this industry. Um, basically, in, instead of having a, a large prepayment upfront, you can have um, a smart contract which slowly releases payment every time a user, let's say, converts or every time they um, you know, buy something on, on your e-commerce store. Um, so that is solving um, a, a pretty niche like, problem within the ad tech, ad tech space. And then there, there's a couple of other problems which we're, we're not really familiar with, but like our advisors are kind of guiding us through. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker, speakers um, are, are unbelievably sort of blinding in their energy and intelligence. You'll see both Carly and Laura really represent um, focus and um, amazing sort of passion for what they're doing. They're both first time founders. Um, Carly is working on a company called Thread Council and Laura is at Stratify. And I know personally that they have worked enormously hard and you know, for anybody that doesn't really know what the ramp looks like, to even just to get to pre-launch, um, which is both, they're both at right now, sometimes it's a few years. And uh, I've seen it personally, um, the trials and tribulations of trying to sort of find the right product to get and solicit user feedback and sort of refine things and work out the team and sort of all of those issues. And um, Carly and Laura are both here to sort of share a little bit of color and insight about what they've gone through uh, just to sort of get to this point. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, great. Well, thank you, Owen, for the absolutely lovely introduction. Uh, Carly and I were just shedding a tear back there. Uh, it was quite, quite wonderful. And we are just so very happy to be here today telling you a li little bit more about our journey thus far, how we got here, and then, of course, answering your questions afterwards. So I'm Laura Kornhauser. I'm the co-founder and COO of Stratify. We are a predictive analytics company that's based around a really cool proprietary technology that brings AI together with IQ, helping businesses make better data-driven decisions. Right now, we're focused on helping lenders write more loans without increasing risk by helping them find those credit-worthy individuals that may be obscured by traditional indicators like FICO score and all of that kind of fun stuff. Carly. Great. And hi, everybody. I'm Carly BG. I'm the founder and CEO of Thread Council. We are a direct-to-consumer women's wear brand. We use data science to make perfect fitting clothing, and everything is personalized to your size, shape, and style through an interactive e-commerce platform. If you haven't heard of us yet, that's by design. <laughs> we are in semi-stealth mode, and we will be launching this fall. Laura and I both started our careers in finance and consulting, and we're going to talk to you for the next 15 minutes or so about the number of pivotal decisions that we made pre, during, and post business school to get us to where we are today with our businesses. 
So now that you know just a little bit about us, we'd love to learn a little bit about everyone we have here. So first and foremost, can we all stand up in those chairs? <laughs> Shake it out. It's been a long morning thus far. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Now, if you are here today and you work in finance or consulting, please take a seat. <laughs> been there. <laughs> If you are here today and you think maybe one day you will work in finance or consulting, please take a seat. Been there too. <laughs> How about all our entrepreneurs? For anybody in the room that has started a company. How about all the folks in the room that hope, are promising entrepreneurs that hope to start a business at some point? Amazing, yeah, love it. And then now, because we are at a technology company or conference, how about everybody that works in technology currently? Okay, 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 okay no, don't worry, this. don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. If you're not sure where you're headed, but today is part of that journey, take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above is also a perfect answer. All you could have that many times. <laughs> and we we're going to say, if there's anyone left standing, which I don't think there is, you might be in the wrong building. <laughs> but lunch is next, so you're in a good place. <laughs> <laughs> so both Carly and I have been in everybody's shoes at some point throughout our journey. As she mentioned, we're here to tell you a little bit more about what we think were the most important points, big decisions we made, and of course, the lessons we learned. Keep those questions to the end. We're happy to answer anything uh, that you all have on your mind. So a little bit about us. I grew up in Houston, Texas. Any Texans in the room? <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> maybe one, maybe two. Um, I had deep roots in the NASA shuttle community. So math and science were literally core to my DNA. And growing up, I was such a problem solver. Anytime I saw a challenge or an opportunity to do something better, I would rally people around it and be laser focused on what that solution was going to be. I was the middle of three kids, incredibly risk averse. <laughs> I, at the age of four, I literally carried around a backpack with tools in it. TSA would take all of them today. <laughs> but the goal was, if I ran across something that needed to be fixed or had an opportunity to build something, I was ready to go. By the time I was a young adult, my friends jokingly called me a bizbot, short for business robot, <laughs> because of my obsession with efficiency and always wanting to analyze businesses. So when it got to, you know, when it came to figuring out what I was going to do for my career, I lined everything up while in undergrad. And the plan was management consulting. It was great. I loved it. There was a plan for everything. I got to travel. I got to work with my clients on their most challenging problems. This could have been a real photo, but isn't. <laughs> Feels familiar. And there was, a, there was a plan for your career. In fact, there was a very linear trajectory for your career. And the plan was that I was going to do my few years in consulting, go off, be sponsored by my firm for business school, dive deep into industry, become an industry expert, and then return as a young partner to pave the way for innovation in that space. Now, that was the plan, and that's what I was going to stick to, but then something happened. I went shopping one Saturday with my friend Matt, and we were both looking for workwear, but we had completely different experiences. So here's Matt. Matt walks into a semi-custom menswear shop, picks out a fabric, sips whiskey, gets measured. He's out the door in 30 minutes. 30 minutes. <laughs> Three days later, he has an impeccable fitting suit at a really reasonable price point. I, on the other hand, ladies in the room, <laughs> go on to visit a dozen different stores, trying a dozen different dresses, trying to find something that sort of fits, that was sort of my style, took it to get tailored, waited a week, and in the end, I paid twice the price for something I liked half as much. And what was even more frustrating was at the time, I was working 100-hour weeks, and now I was working 50. And, I was at, and it just, I couldn't get over the fact that on the back end, there were so many efficiencies that existed for him that didn't for me. And I wondered, why was it that somebody hadn't solved for this yet? What, like, what could be the solution? And that day, I started to dig in. So I grew up in the great state of New Jersey, uh, right in the center. Jersey, Jersey in the house, awesome. <laughs> uh, as the daughter of two software entrepreneurs, uh, my parents started a company right around the time that I was born. So I got the privilege of having a front row seat uh, via the dinner table to uh, a lot of the trials and tribulations that they went through as they proceeded to grow uh, and then run that small business throughout my life. 
I always had had entrepreneurial dreams and pursuits. I always was a problem solver, always loved working together with really smart people to accomplish something. I was an athlete, really thrived in these kinds of team environments. But I got to my senior year of college, uh, I went to Princeton, didn't go too far from home, uh -huh. and I really had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was an operations research and financial engineering major, aka statistics on steroids, or the longest title of a major ever. Uh, and you know, everybody was going into finance, right? We had finance in our major, for crying out loud. Uh, so it seemed like that's the path I should take. It was the well-defined career path uh, that was the safe answer, if you will. And so I went that way and got a job at a prestigious firm working in banking. Uh, and my first year can be described a heck of a lot like this. Uh, didn't see a whole lot of sunlight. Didn't really know what I was doing for most of the time. Uh, it was a lot of operating in that great unknown space. Uh, learning a ton, uh, being thrown into a lot of challenges, uh, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but again, feeling a little unsatisfied. And so around a year into my banking job, I got a call from one of my good friends who worked at the same firm on the trading floor. She said, there's an opportunity in the derivatives team. This is perfect for you, Laura. It's a great group of people. You have to apply. I thought, oh, I'm not ready. I've only been in this job for a year. It's too soon to make the move. She encouraged me. I went. 24 hours later, I had an offer. I then needed to decide what the heck I was going to do with it, which I wasn't quite prepared for, but spoke with some mentors of mine that had actually recruited me to banking. They encouraged me to take that leap, really taught me the importance of having a strong network around you to not only support you, but help nudge you towards those risks that you may not even realize you're ready for yourself. So I thought I'd be walking into an environment like this, you know, trading places kind of style, frozen OJ. It was a little more like this. Uh, and needless to say, I had a whole lot to learn. I really set out and tried to be very deliberate about acquiring skills along the way and ended up spending 11 years working within the derivatives business, helping institutional clients build and to deploy risk management strategies. Uh, learned an absolute ton, uh, but knew that it wasn't really the perfect thing for me. Had always had dreams of going to business school, so when I was 28 years old, I took the GMAT. I never went to business school. It was 2009. I didn't really feel like I knew exactly what I was going to business school for. I thought, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. But everybody had told me, you don't go to business school to be an entrepreneur. That's not the, the way to do it. <laughs> so I stayed in my job. I thought I would have that Isaac Newton moment, that great idea would just hit me, and I slowly realized that that was just not happening, working 100-hour work weeks and grinding all the time. I knew I needed to take that leap, and it just so happened that my GMAT score was about to expire. <laughs> so I went ahead and I applied to business school. I knew either I would go to business school or I would take that time off and pursue these entrepreneurial dreams that I always knew I had really learned, again, the importance of having a strong network around you, supporting you, the value of things like external deadlines and expiring GMAT scores, mm -hmm. and that while there are a lot of things you can do to prepare yourself and de-risk these decisions, at some point you ultimately just need to go for it and trust yourself and trust what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Carly. So we, yeah. We both ended up at Columbia Business School. We both huh. ended up at Columbia Business School. <laughs> Very familiar site. Um, so remember that plan I talked about? I was going to you know, do my couple years in consulting, be sponsored for business school, dive deep into industry, return as a young partner, and pave the way for innovation? Spoiler alert. <laughs> Didn't happen. <laughs> Instead, I got to school and I started talking to people. And what I learned was every female classmate, every female professor, every woman I spoke with in New York had a similar experience of struggling to find perfect fitting attire. And so I found the one woman who I knew who had started a business before school, and I said, Erin, we should get coffee. <laughs> and I met her at Joe's Coffee on Columbia's campus, and I said, I've got an idea, and I think we should work on it together. And she says, OK, Carly, if you pitch me right now, I'll think about it. I was like, okay. So I cobbled together my first pitch of the business, I, you know, the business, the main challenges, the different operating models we could pursue, why I thought we'd be great partners, mumbled through it, and just watched this big smile come across her face. And she said, I can't say no to this. I'm in. Let's get started. I was like, great, okay. 
But the problem was I lined up every single offer that I wrote about in my application. So I had all these internship offers that I thought was the plan, and I went to a mentor of mine at Columbia who had been active in my career search, and I said, Cliff, and he said, Carly, congratulations. You've got all the offers. What do you want to do? Where, where are we headed this summer? And I looked him in the eye, and I said, Cliff, I don't, I don't think I'm going to accept any of them. In fact, I think I'm going to go to an e-commerce company, and I'm going to go to the startup and work twice as many hours and make half the amount of money, and I'm going to learn everything about the business so that I can go on and do this on my own. Because you see, I have this vision where we can use data science to make perfect fitting clothing, and I just I have to pursue it. I think I have to go after this. And he said, I think you do too. And in that moment, I felt such relief because I was worried going into the conversation that Cliff was going to be disappointed. He had put his neck out for me. He had made a million introductions. He had championed me along the way. And I thought because I wasn't going to take the pre-prescribed internships that he would feel some sense of being let down. But it was the opposite. What I learned in that moment is that a true mentor is going to champion your passions no matter what they are. And that you just have to trust yourself and go with your gut. What was your first semester like? <laughs> <laughs> sure was interesting. And funnily enough, a cliff was actually extraordinarily uh, influential in my decision to come to CBS as well. You had a cliff too. I had a cliff too, <laughs> for sure. I actually went to the admit, weeding, me, uh, admit weekend excuse me, for Columbia Business School, and Cliff hosted a panel uh, with a bunch of CBS entrepreneurs on it. And a number of the folks on the panel said they had come to Columbia to pursue entrepreneurship. They didn't know exactly what that meant, exactly where they would find themselves. They knew they either wanted to start something or join an early stage startup. Uh, and here, all of these four panelists had found their ways into actually co-founding or founding their own companies. Super inspirational for me. It was a lot, very different than a lot of the other advice I had received to date, and really, really struck me as, oh my gosh, I can come to CBS in New York City with so much opportunity around me to explore fintech, which was what I thought I wanted to do, and really test out this hypothesis, right? A lot of being an entrepreneur is testing hypothesis that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'd worked for 12 years in traditional finance at a very large company with over 200,000 people. And here I thought I wanted to make this huge transition. Uh, I really needed to de-risk that a little bit as well and really prove to myself that I had what it takes to actually survive in that environment. And I wasn't just another finance person that didn't really like doing banking, that was going to go into technology and start a company because that was really cool. Uh, so I spent my first year at CBS. Uh, taking every class I possibly could uh, to help really build out my skill set. I took absolutely no finance classes, uh, except for real estate finance, which was fantastic, uh, during my time at CBS. Really was focused on building out my skill set, figuring out where my strengths and weaknesses really lied. What did I really like to do? What motivated me? Um, and was this hypothesis of wanting to go found a company something I could actually do? I had four different internships during my first year, uh, working with companies in different spaces, at different stages, in different roles. Again, testing angles of this hypothesis. The good news was I proved to myself that at least I wanted to do it and I thought I could. Mm -hmm. Then spent the summers in between my first and second year working in venture really wanted to understand how the other side of the table looks at founders, at businesses, at early stage ideas. I was going to use those same skills to figure out either who I should join, join with, because I think team is so important, um, or what early stage company I should join, because I knew that was one of the two things I was going to do. Knew where I wanted to go, didn't know how I was going to get there. Came back to second year, and my good friend uh, and cluster mate, Michael, uh, who is our, my co-founder and our CEO, was super excited about what has become Stratify. He had been working with two other engineers on this really cool technology that they thought had really interesting applications in finance, and he wanted to pick my brain to talk about what I thought. My background in risk management, I had built some technology products while on, my, on the trading floor, kind of fit really well with what he was working on. And I saw the huge applications for this technology and all the wonderful things we could do. I also saw an amazing team with non-overlapping skill sets, a heck of a lot of experience, and a team that, to be honest, I was flattered to be offered a spot to join in. And we started our company uh, not, too, not too far after that second year fall. Yeah. Uh, Carly and I had some really wonderful experiences, many of them together, during our second, uh, second half of our second year, helping to get our businesses really off the ground. 
taking what started off as kind of very, very little seedlings and using the fantastic environment and the nurturing environment of a business school, New York City, to really grow, grow those seedlings into something that we could actually start to take out into the world once we graduated. Yeah, similar experience. I mean, we, we came in second year and just started building. We bootstrapped operations. We lined up our first 1,000 pre-orders with questionable uh, landing page. Uh, and then we leveraged every single resource that we could use between the Columbia Business School Network and Columbia University. And it got to the point where I had to choose between launching this company or going back to consulting. I mean, we were graduating. And so I called a mentor from my firm, and I said, Maureen, I don't know which office I want for my consulting offer. I'm between New York and Chicago, and here's the pros and the cons, and here's how I'm thinking about them. And she, <laughs> she just started laughing and goes, Carly, that's not the question. The question is, how do we get you out of this offer? Because you need to go focus on the business full time. And I said, no, 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 I've got a plan. I'm going to work on it during the week at nights, and then I'm going to meet with my team on Saturday, Sunday, and fundraise on Fridays. And then once we're ready to launch, I'll leave the firm. And she said, no, <laughs> you need to go all in. And what I realized in that moment was that in order to be an ace of spades, I couldn't be a jack of all trades. And to move forward with my new dream and my new plan, I had to let go of my old dream and my own plan. And that's exactly what I did. So Laura and I stand here in front of you today. We both have our first mill in the bank. We both have our team set up, and we have launch dates planned this year. Uh, and really what it took was getting comfortable moving from the known career path of consulting and finance and all these pivotal decisions along the way into the unknown journey of launching our own businesses. Support has been a key theme throughout what Carly and I have both spoken about. Support from your family, your friends, your network, your mentors, your sponsors, your advisors. Nothing could be more important uh, when going out on what can at times be a re reasonably lonely journey of starting a company. Uh, so we were both really fortunate to have that as wind in our sails. And a lot of what you think starting a company is about is something like this, you know, a thrilling adventure uh, that is just so amazing at every turn, when in reality... In reality, it's a series of steps, and it's lining up, you know, not only your passion, but also the ability to generate value, the ability to have the skill set to recruit the right team, and then the comfort with the fact that we really don't have a parachute. <laughs> like, once, you, once you've severed that tie, you know, with your past career and you've moved on, that's what you're doing. Um, but there's just so many things that you can do along the way to, again, help de-risk what is a very risky decision and really set up the odds in your favor. You know, having an idea, having a passion for something, unfortunately alone is not enough. Those are table stakes. You have to have that to even get yourself in the ring. To be able to succeed from there, uh, you need all of these other things, the support, the trust in yourself, and, and the willingness to really take that leap. And I was just going to say that in conclusion, I know we're at time, thank you team, with all yeah. the excuse, uh, that we just want to say that uh, we hope that you ask yourself that if you are interested in starting a company, if this is you know, something you will do one day or if today is day one. And we encourage you to take the leap and we thank you for your time today and we'll welcome any questions now. Thank you so much. Any questions? Questions? Do we have time for questions? <laughs> I had a question. Um, I don't know how much like experience you had with making clothing, but but so how did you gain those skills or gain what to ask for when you were building this new like brand that? You're starting. Yeah, I was that person who was like tailoring my t-shirts in middle school. Like I would tailor my underwear if it wasn't weird. <laughs> so I always had that eye for aesthetic and, and perfect fit in my, in my core of who I was. Um, but I just, I built a fortress of mentors around us. I said, here's what I know. I know how to build a team. I know how to set vision. And I know how to set a, a structure to go achieve that. But I need a designer. I need someone who can help build the brand. I need our head of product, all of whom are here today. Couldn't do it without them. <laughs> and by the way, like once we're all on the ship together, I'm going to let you do what you do best, and then we're going to do it as a team. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's part of the process. It's just understanding what it takes to get you there. I'm not a fashion designer, but I do love our clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Hiya. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, building out the team, uh, kind of like how to find, like, say, the best tech or, like, um, 
I don't know, like just areas where you're not a specialist in? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously finding tech talent is, is not trivial. It's a very hard thing to do. And in general, hiring is, is, is very challenging, right? Um, the old adage of hire, slow, fire, fast, I think is, is probably pretty darn accurate. Um, but when you're in our stage, you don't have a whole lot of luxury of time. You tend to need skills and need skills kind of right away. Uh, I think part of it is, is what Carly mentioned, uh, you know, really knowing where you need those skills is, is the first part of the problem. So to achieve your dream, uh, I don't know if you have a technology background, but if you do, that's wonderful, but I'm sure you have blind spots there. What are those blind spots and, and where do you need to actively hire people that are really exceptional at that? Uh, it really goes also back to what Carly said on the jack of all trades, kind of master of none. Um, you know, you want people that are kind of generally good at a lot of things, but you really, at least from our business, from a technology side, we need people that are very good at one thing. Uh, and the real challenge for us uh, initially was just knowing exactly what those things are. And now we are, you know, I would say not done with, but we've hired our first couple really key hires that round out that scale of our founding team. There's many more that we need, but being very laser focused about uh, what talents and skills you need to acquire, I think is very important. And just to 